I'd like to welcome y'all back to the 90 Proof Lounge, conversations of the 90s, the golden era, 100% hip-hop and G-Funk. I'm Nick Cleveland. Tonight, we got a straight-up Menace Style exclusive with a Compton legend, a pioneer gangster rap, rapper, actor, businessman, and all-out vet to the game. It's my pleasure to welcome the one and only Compton Psycho, MC8. How you doing, bro? Yeah, what's cracking, fam? Everything good? That's good, man. As we always do about this time, we're going to get right into it. You've done so many amazing things uh, in your career in the 90s. I mean, with the solo albums, the group albums. What was the energy like between you guys being able to get in the studio and doing your first album with so many creative um, artists at one time? Um, just what was some of the most memorable moments, the studio sessions, and just the all-out vibe between all of you guys when you guys were doing It's a Compton thing? Um, like I said, we had been together for a little minute. Me and Chio had, you know, we've been around each other since junior high school, even though we wasn't that much out of high school when we started recording. Um, the initial vibe was just, you know, uh, you know, a little excitement, um, uh, eager to, uh, finally be able to put down a, a full length project. You know, we have dropped a couple of singles before, but, uh, just to be able to put out a full length project, you know, of different uh, material uh, was pretty exciting for us. It was the early time of hip hop. You know, I myself was a big fan of hip hop. So early hip hop. So uh, just a chance to be able to get out there and show people what Contest Most Wanted was about and to be uh, a, a little diverse with the music, you know, uh, I always felt like um, we always came from a different angle than your typical uh, your typical artists at the time. So um, the vibe was pretty good. DJ Slip, you know, uh, we were excited because DJ Slip was one of those producers who would, uh, he knew our flavor. It wasn't like we had to uh, try to come up with a lot of shit to fit our style uh, for the fact that we had been working with him for, you know, maybe a year or so already. Uh, the chance to go into the studio and have that vibe of, of being a real artist, man. So it, it was good when we first started recording this Compton thing. Yeah, and it's it's funny that you said that because I was thinking the same thing going through all of your music. I mean, having a producer like DJ Slip, he was just giving you guys magic. And you and the best thing was you guys knew what to do with it, right? And I noticed that uh, out of all the albums, this is a Compton thing. There was a lot of you and chill on a lot of the tracks and just two amazing MCs, you know, going back and forth on a lot of the tracks. This is Compton and, and you know, final chapter. It was just amazing to see that. And uh you see it start to progress too when it goes into a Compton thing, and then you have straight checking them. And um, I did read that you had lost chill to uh, some jail time or whatever when you guys were doing that album. I don't know how accurate that is, but uh, you know, Slips sure delivered again on the second album as well. So how was the, was the second album? Uh, you know, just as exciting as the first album, or were you guys still progressing, trying to do new things with that? Um, you know, um. Chill had, uh, you know, we lost Chill, you know, um, unfortunately during the middle of this Accompton thing. So if you ever listen to this Accompton thing, you'll hear majority of the songs are me on solo. Um, I think Chill missed the final chapter. He missed uh, uh, I Give Up Nothing. He missed uh, this Accompton thing. Yep. So there was a few songs, and then on Straight Checking Them, um, he was only on Growing Up in the Hood because right. he had recorded that song prior to him uh, being incarcerated. So um, basically, Straight Checking Them was just trying to advance the sound of, you know, from being premature with con but with it's a Compton thing, uh experimenting a lot, you know. Um uh, we're a little more confident. Uh I was a little more confident in my delivery and um, you know, my writing skills as far as sticking to subjects that were, you know, dear to me and what I thought was going on um, you know, across the board. Uh so uh 
we were we were able to flex a little bit more on straight checking them. Um, we had moved over to a new label over to Epic. Uh, so we had left Orpheus Capital, went over to Epic. So we had a little more uh, power behind the machine, thus uh, promotion, uh, videos. So uh, we were able to, you know, flex a little bit more, but we still tried to keep that Compton's most wanted uh, sound as far as DJ Slip concerned. Uh, still a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, chopping of samples that weren't typical. Um, we didn't do the typical George Clinton's or Parliament or or Roger, you know, Trout or Zap and all that. You know, that was a that was a familiar sound with the West Coast. Right. Uh, we just wanted to be different than everybody else uh, out here in L.A. because everybody was brought up on you know that old school funk. Uh, we just wanted to be different. So, you know, uh, it was very easy uh, to come up with our sound because we weren't following the path of typical West Coast sound. Right. And I agree. I was actually a homie of mine age just said that to me. He was like the way that Compton's most wanted was using samples was just it wasn't being done like that. You guys were completely original with it and uh, come touching more on uh, growing up in the hood. I mean, how successful was that? I mean, it's a boys in the hood soundtrack. I read it was number one on rap charts at the time. Just such an amazing record. And I found that uh, with what you were saying about slip, I mean, I found that you you guys as a whole, as Compton's Most Wanted, were always trying to progress to another level with every single project. I mean, and putting out so much content in the 90s was 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 crazy. So um you see that. And then just with the group together, you know, DJ Mike T with 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 the scratches. It, I mean, it was unbelievable. What was your if you had to choose um on this is a uh, it's a Compton thing and straight checking them. What were your favorite two favorite songs off of those albums? Um, I have to say on it's a Compton thing. My favorite song was probably Final Chapter. Yeah. Um, and then on straight checking them, I'd have to say uh, maybe Wanted. Uh, Wanted was one of my favorites. Um, just just to be able to you know um advance from it's a Compton thing like i said we were rough rugged and raw we are just coming out you know young cats trying to compete in the world of, of hip-hop especially coming from where we come from because you had q body in nwa you know ice t king t um above the law I mean, you name them, you know, they kept coming as far as uh, the West Coast is concerned, as far as L.A. is concerned. So we always prided ourselves on being different than than everyone else. That's where uh, Slip's mind came in. Um, I always wanted to tell stories. I didn't want to just be typical and talk about, you know, everyday average stuff that was going on in Compton. I wanted to advance my shit and tell more like stories of of the unfortunate side of, of being from the neighborhood. I never wanted to glorify uh, the situations we were in. Thus comes our music from that. And uh, Slip was always just uh, a guy who dug in the crates. You know, um, he was never... Uh, uh, typical when it came to production uh, he wanted to be different than whatever was going on and like i said a lot of that was parliament and uh george clinton atomic dog sounding you know we he wanted to be different from that i knew that from the first day i met slip with just the way he sampled and chopped up samples and what he looked for and we were just we were we were musical. We weren't just the typical boom bap boom bap, and that just came from wanting to be you know different and advance our craft better than the next do. You know, we wanted to give people something cinematic to listen to. 
Absolutely. And I could even see that um, because the more I went through your albums and I've, I've always been a fan, I'm just having to revisit all of it to, because, you know, we're doing this interview, but um, I noticed like even the little things like with, with how you guys were doing the interludes, even, even with the interludes on your guys's album, you weren't hearing interludes like that on anybody's album. It was either, you know, uh, some comedy or whatever but you guys were literally putting soulful instrumentals in there to to carry you all the way through and then you got the smooth voice that was kind of carrying it out you weren't seeing it so you guys were definitely doing something that was unheard at that point and unique um as you do start to progress from straight checking them then you do music to drive by unbelievable i mean it's an undeniable album um but when you guys started to, at what point did you guys start? How did that go when you decided to start bringing in other production? Because to skip a little bit forward, you get into uh, uh, Death Threats, which is is my favorite uh, solo album that you did. Um, you start to see more production. Young prod, Prodigy from South Central Cartel comes in and starts helping. Then it, you know, moves forward. And then Last Man Standing, you have, you know, Daz is on production. DJ Muggs is, is huge on production on that album as well. So when did you guys start deciding, hey, maybe we should start bringing in some other production to kind of uh, join in? Well, that had to basically do with taking ownership of the projects, Um you know, being young, coming into the business, you know, I had to come up through someone. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, at the time that was unknown and his big beat productions, which he had techno hop records. Uh, and so, you know, we all got to start somewhere. So that was my start. Uh, I was linked to unknown at the hip. Um, and it was just unfortunate that things happen with unknown to where, you know, it's the early days of hip hop. You know, I don't know shit. I'm 17 years old, gang banging right. from the neighborhood, you know, selling drugs and shit. I didn't know anything about the rules of being a artist, you know, writers and, and publishing and all that type of shit. I just wanted to rap. You feel me? So... Right not being knowledgeable and again you know i'm 17 still living at home with moms in compton gang banging on the block every day she didn't even know i was signing a record contract when i first fucked with her no um i'm not knowledgeable i didn't have an attorney i can't afford no attorney i didn't even know about you know a attorney what the fuck is that gonna even come to play right. so um it was unfortunate that I got, you know, publishing stolen and all of that. So with with advancing in the music business, you turn to start learning shit. You get me? And as the years progress from project to project, you start noticing certain things. So at the time of me getting this role to do uh, AWACS and Minister Society, um, I basically started coming into my own of dealing with my own business. You feel me? Right. You know, um, just like I had negotiated the fucking growing up in the hood. You know, I met John Singleton. That's how I was able to get the song because he saw me personally and, hey, I want you on the, the soundtrack. Um, you know, when I did St. Eyes commercials, you know, I negotiated those deals. So I started getting the business side of it. So when it was time to do music to drive by, I'm knowing that the business is fucked up. Mm -hmm. If I'm the artist, I'm writing all the songs, doing half the beats and performing on stage. And you just the dude in the corner collecting all the money. That's got to stop one day. You get right. me? So you can attribute that happening to why the door of production started opening for me to fuck with other dudes. Because now that I'm in control of my own shit, I could go, oh no, hell no. You're not finna, you no. I want him to do a beat. I want him to do a beat. I want him to do it. So that's how uh, different production started coming to play. Uh, being able to be in control of my projects 
allowed me to open the door to deal with other producers and other sounds, which I started with myself. Uh, me and Slip form Half Ounce Productions, and I started doing half of the production, or I would bring in, like you say, a, a Rick Rock or a Blackjack or a Daz or Muds or, or whoever, because now I'm in control of the production on the project, you know? Thus, really, I was in the beginning. I didn't know how to press a button or before I had an MPC and learned all that, I would just basically give my ideas to Slip. And mm -hmm. Slip would go, hey, okay. Or I would sit down with a guy who knew how to play a keyboard and be like, hey, play this riff and play it like this and add that and add that. So I was already, you know, given suggestions of how production would go. But being able to break away from unknown, I was able to start going, okay, now we can bring in dads to do a beat. We can bring in this cat to do a beat because now it's not like unknown controlling and going, oh no, only people going to do beats for this record is me and Slip. You get me? And I and really most of the time when that was happening, Slip was doing 80% of the production. Right, right. And uh, <clears throat> to touch on uh, a little bit about how, uh, like when you started meeting other producers, uh, we had an interview uh, earlier with a good homeboy of yours, Spice One, great interview. And he had, we had talked to him about the production on his albums and Blackjack. Did you link up with Blackjack through Spice? Yes, I did. Um, I did. I think we produced, a, yeah, we produced the murder show for Spice One. Um because of the Menace to Society soundtrack went to Jive and Spice was signed to Jive. So because Menace was so successful, we were brought in to do some mixes on Spice's record. And then we uh, ended up, me and Slip ended up producing the murder show for his record. That's how that came about. And uh, so, uh, me and Spice, like, been familiar, like, we've been buddies for a long time. And like I tell people, you know, you, in this industry, you tend to meet certain people that after you make that first connection, it just seems like, you know, we gonna be fucking around with each other forever, my nigga. So that's how that happened with Spice. Uh, we were two young dudes. He was from the Bay. I was from Compton. We were both on the same type of shit. You know, he had neighborhood tales. I had neighborhood tales. And through the grace of, of Minister Society, uh, we were able to meet because of the soundtrack. And then because of that, I was able to do some work on his record. And we've just been fucking with each other ever since. So um, I used to love Spice Records. You get me? So Absolutely. when I heard Blackjack production on his record, uh, I was like, man, who the fuck is that, man? He's pretty hard. And so I linked up with Blackjack and I got him to do like three or four cuts on death threats, you know, he, and then and I just opened the door for the dudes, you know, to, it was, it was talented dudes out here who were stuck in that, 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 that circle of, they only got to fuck with the niggas in their camp. You get me? I wanted to fuck with all kind of dudes, but when you under somebody's umbrella, they tend to not want you to fuck with anybody. Not that it's not going to be a good thing, but it was always money involved and motherfuckers want to keep all the money. You know what I'm saying? Back then niggas was getting 10, 15, 20 thousand dollars for beats. You get me? So why would somebody want some another producer to come in and and you know and and take money off the table? But I didn't look at it like that. I looked at it like, you know, everybody has a get different sound. And sometimes opening the door and having them different sounds on your record is what draw in a lot more fans, man. Cause you know. Blackjack might have his fans of his own because of his music. So now I get to get some of them, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm working with him. So I always looked at it like that. It's always good to fuck with, you know, people who's in the best interest and you fans of. And I was a fan of his production-wise. 
Yeah, and it's it's crazy because actually in the interview with him, he said the same thing about you. He actually told us a story when he first picked you up. I think he said it was at an Oakland airport, and he he, yeah. had, he, he had a 5.0, and he started spinning donuts and did an 8 and was like, that's your name. That's your name. You know what I yeah, mean? Spice. spice has always been a, uh, you know, he's a little bigger than me, but he's always been a little brother to me. You feel me? You know, right. he's always excited when we link up and we always touring together. Matter of fact, I got, I just did a show with him a couple of weeks ago and, and we, we, we together in Cleveland in a couple of weeks. So, you know, we always make sure, and that's one good thing because uh, if promoters hit me up, about doing shows, I always suggest him and he fights versa. He'll do a show and they probably ask him who else, you know, or whatever. And he always throws my, my name in the hat. So I've done, we've done exchange plenty of work like that. And it's good. Like I said, to uh, have genuine friends in this crazy hip hop world. You feel me? Absolutely. That's what it's all about, man. And yeah, I agree with you, man. Ever since I've 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 got to talk to Spice and deal with him and NQ, they've just been just top notch people. Um, to touch a little bit more on uh Menace of Society. I watched an interview where I I you had spoke about how when you first heard about the script, you didn't you weren't really into doing it. Uh when you decided to do it, did you really realize I just watched it again probably for like the hundredth time the other night and uh I was just thinking to my did you have any idea how big that movie was gonna be and not only that i mean look at who you're working with you're working lorenz tate jada pinkett samuel l jackson and out of all those people i've spoken to a lot of people that i know and awax is their favorite character a lot of people say that and and a lot of people like i grew up with guys who were so 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 big on that movie that their nicknames were awax when we were growing up and it had being did you have any idea that that was going to be the result of doing that movie um, being a, uh, if you want to say an MC, uh, coming from where I come from, you know, rapping about the shit I rap about, uh, I really didn't think too much of it. Um, I mean, I did a hundred videos, you know what I'm saying? Um, nice. but at the time, um, the street movies were getting popular. You know, um, we had South Central, we had Juice, we had fucking Boys in the Hood, you know, so uh, we had Trespass with Ice Cube and Ice T and, you know, yeah. so the movies was getting up there with, and then using the rappers as actors was getting popular. So um, the Hughes brothers who um, were going to school out here, I think living in Pomona, something like that, I could be wrong. But they were here in L.A. And um, at the time, um, one time gaffled them up, which was my first single off of It's a Compton thing. And, you know, back then we had the video jukebox where you could just call up and the order box. the video, right? The box. So one time gaffled them up was playing all over the city at that time. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about everywhere, hundred times on the box, you know, you'd see it. And right. So I guess they had become fans of Compton's most wanted. And, you know, they looking at my videos and them being video directors themselves of Tupac, you know, they like, Hmm. When when they when they wrote the movie and they figuring out the characters and you know they watching MC8 and they like uh let's see if this motherfucker could you know at least read a script. Mm -hmm. um, I heard they had uh, also auditioned Ren for the part. Right. I, I thought nothing of it because let's face it, it's fucking MC Ren. You get me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, in a nutshell, we come yeah. count as most wanted in MC8, but come on, it's fucking MC Ren. And um, yeah. Exactly. So I looked at it like, why are they wasting their time sending me a script? Because who's not going to give it to MC Ren? Right. You, you feel me? Um, I heard Ren wasn't interested, you know, um, or that they didn't like the vibe of the reading when he came in. So 
they called me and I went down there. I didn't think shit of it. You know, first of all, I'm driving all the way to Hollywood, which I didn't like. So I'm like, man, you know, but my manager is like, yeah, you know, you got to go do this shit. They requested you to. So I'm like, whatever, you know, I was, I was very, you know, I was one of those motherfuckers like, well, I'm going to turn down appointments and shit like that, you know, because I'm an artist now. So fuck it. So I goes to this shit and niggas is sitting in the rooms and they asked me to read a part. And I read it like, like I'm talking to you now. You feel me? That's okay. my, that's me. That's my persona from the, from the days of me being on the block in the neighborhood. I'm just laid back, simple, a low tone ass nigga. Right. Um, I guess they liked it. Um, I went home about a week and a half later. Uh, they told me to come back up and read again. So I'm like, whatever. I leave the studio. I go back up there. I'm in the process of working on uh, music to drive by. Um, so um, I go back, read again, whatever. Everything is good. Um, I go on tour for for uh, music to drive by. It's getting ready to come out. So right. I go on tour to promote the album and I think I'm in the hotel somewhere and my manager called me and said that I got the part. So I had to come home because they was finna start doing table reads and all that shit. And I still didn't think it was, you know, going to be, did I think it was going to be as big as a boys in the hood or, you know, because I'm looking at who, I'm like, I'm MC8. You talking about Cube and all you give me motherfuckers who were significant, um, as I fit as I felt at the time that I was a fan of. You get me? Uh, but uh being able to work with Tyron and then old dog and then Lorenz, Lorenz, and then I went to school with Vonte and then um, you know, Jada was there and all these people, you know, these actors and these movie people. So, you know, as it started mature and it started getting a little fire and people started talking about it and I'm going places and doing interviews about it, you know, I figured it would probably be just as just as good as uh, Boys in the Hood. Did I think it was going to go as far as it did? Um, no. I mean, but that's the beauty of shit when you try shit out and um, it, it's on a real aspect, you know, because a lot of the movie, um, even though I had a script, I was able to ad lib a lot of shit because being from the, you know, the neighborhood at one time, um, it was a certain shit I knew that we didn't do or didn't dress a certain way. So I was able to flex that a lot on the movie set as far as my wardrobe and lines I had in the movie. And a lot of times I was just told to ad lib. Right on. As you, as you were saying about uh, doing that, and then as you started to, to touch more, a little bit more on, uh, the music, when you start to get into, you know, um, Section 8, which is an amazing album, you've now hooked up with Mac 10. It's who banging. Um, and you guys did a lot of great things, too. You end up getting into, you know, Thicker Than Water and right. and, and and doing the same things that you were doing just with that. So how did you end up hooking up with Mac 10 and coming up oh. with the idea to do uh, Section 8? I basically um, had did my last record for Sony. Um which was last man standing. Um, they did offer me a re-up deal for like three more records, but uh, secretly I had signed a nine album production deal with a uh, big beat Atlantic uh, with Craig Kalman. Um, I don't know how that came about. Oh, um, I ended up, I don't know how the fuck I met Craig, but with the success of of Menace and then the success of We Come Strapped, I started meeting a lot of, you know, executives. Um, so I don't know. I was approached by Craig Kalman, you know, from Big Beat Atlantic. And um, he knew I wasn't happy at Sony. 
because let's face it, I never believed Sony believed in MC8 or Compton's Most Wanted. Yeah, well, uh, we, never, we never got, you know, a lot of push that we should have gotten. You know, I would get to the point to where I would get to ready to sell a million records and they would pull the record or stop promotion and shit like that. So um, I just never understood you know, the, the relationship as far as I had with them. But anyway, I met Craig. Craig offered me a nine album production deal because at the time I was promoting my groups, which was NOTR, Niggas on the Run, and Lil Hawk and Bird. So um, um, Craig offered me a three album deal for each of us, me, NOTR, Lil Hawk and Bird under Eight Height Productions. And so I signed the deal. Um, I still had two albums left with Epic, which was Death Threats and Last Man Standing. So um, I finished those projects in the in the in the process, and in the meantime, we had recorded a full length album on NOTR. Mm. So once Last Man Standing was turned in. I was ready to head over to Atlantic and get shit cracking. Um, at the time, uh, there was a lot of, of um, what you want to say. There was a lot of there was a lot of flat going on about Ice T and Body Count okay. because of because of the Cop Killer record. Right. Right. At that time, Ice-T with the rock group, they had dropped Cop Killer, which was under Warner Brothers. So with all the backlash they were getting, Warner and its parent companies, Elektra and Atlantic, decided we're not going to touch no gangster shit. That's when the, the, the... that's what the pause with death row and all that bullshit. So me being MC8, Compton, gangster shit, it put my production deal on, on pause. Uh, okay. So that's why NOTR, who record was turned in and it, it got shelved because they didn't want to release it. Um so I walk in the door and start going, okay, where's my budget? Let's get it cracking. I need to start working on the record. It was like, hold up. We need to basically change the style of music you're putting out if we're going to continue this deal. Okay. So I went from being able to produce my own records and talk about my shit to where they're bringing in Timbaland sounding producers and want me to rap about summertime in the park and, you know, having fun in the club and shit like that, which is not my style. So again, the brakes were put on everything. So we went back and forth, back and forth. And basically the deal got canned. I got a I got a servants package to walk away quietly, and that's what happened, and thus how I ended up on who banging because in the process of me going through maybe a a two year uh you know be- between last man standing and section eight was maybe a year and a half or so. And so in that process, I was fucking with Snoop a lot. Right. Um, I was hanging with dog a lot, you know, going to his crib at the studio, just hanging like two homies. You know, I'd been knowing Snoop since junior high school. So um, he was, he just signed to no limit. So uh, hanging with him, of course, I was going to get introduced to P and all of them. And, you know, again, you know, UMC8, Minister Society, all my nigga, I've been listening to, you You know, Silk the Shocker was, you know, all of them, you know, yeah. eight, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was decided that I was going to sign to No Limit. Oh, wow. Um, so 
you know, I met P, Boz, everybody. We in the studio, you know, the, the night I met them, I'm in there writing raps and shit, you know. They got me in the studio writing lyrics, whatever. So I'm about to do this deal with No Limit. It's finna drop any day now. I'm, getting, I'm talking to Boz, talking to P, it's finna happen any day now. Yeah. And in the process... I was working on a song for, I don't know who I was doing a song for. I was at a studio that happened to be around the corner from where Mac 10 used to record at. So Mac 10 had got wind of me getting ready to sign to No Limit because it was all through priority. Mm -hmm. And he was signed to priority, you know, you know. Right. Yep. So he got wind of it. And he called me up at the studio and told me to come around to see him. And when I went up to the studio, um, he offered me some money on the spot to do a song for Thicker Than Water. Okay. And then from there, he was like, man, I want to sign you to Who Bangin'. You know, you should stay West Coast. Don't go to, you know, no limit, you know, fuck all that shit. And so I sat on it for about a week and then I decided, fuck it, I'm going to sign the hoop bag. So that's how I ended up with Mac 10. Yeah, like that's crazy, man. Thank you for telling telling me that, man, because I'm a big fan of No Limit and, and you saying that I'd never heard it and that that would be I'm just thinking now of how amazing that would have been. But it definitely worked out. You did Section 8, which was amazing. Um I wanted to touch on something too. So we just had a previous guest on our last episode. Uh, his name's G Lan. He was a uh, 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 connected to the banging on wax on the blood side and was a part of Damu Riders. And and I was speaking to him and I said, "What was the impact that the banging on wax records had in that in your guys's area?" And um, the more that I got into looking to, into your music, as I said, I was always a huge fan. But when you really really listen to your music all the way through on each album. I mean, it, it's gangbang music. You represent Compton to the fullest and where you're from and what you're doing on a daily basis. What do, what was your um, input on how the Banging on Wax uh, albums, when they came out, was that a surprise? Did it have a positive influence on um, the people around you? And, and, and what, what was your thoughts on uh, the Banging on Wax? Was, well, at the time, it was looked at as positive because niggas were being able to represent their sections on a record and that hadn't been done before right you know we we were listening to rap music and shit but a lot of the rap music was you know the wrecking crew turn off the lights and you know uh egyptian lover and a lot of techno uh uh music uh, right our, our rap that we got for that type of shit, you had to get that from a nigga off of TDK tape who was rapping in his garage trying to talk about his neighborhood. Right. So, because making a record was unheard of, even though it was easy as shit if you look at it today. <laughs> yeah. Back then, making a record was unheard of. You get me? Mm -hmm. Records, that shit like, Stevie Wonder make records. You get me? Fucking Temptations make records. Like, yep, yep. Who, the, who the fuck is going to, like, we some crack selling brag toting niggas. How <laughs> we going to make records? And then, so to be able to hear a motherfucker on a record, and he talking about what set he from, and he finna go do something to the enemy from the other side. Oh man, that was pure bliss to us. It was like, it was rap royalty, you get me? And everybody played banging on wax from, from Compton, LA, the West Coast period as far as Southern California is concerned, because it, it, was, it was a demographic that was changing our music front. You feel me? Because like I said, we had shit like the Wrecking Crew. And not to disrespect the Wrecking Crew, because that was West Coast music at the time. You right. get me? Yep. Nobody thought about talking about blood or cuz on a record or I'm from a hundredth street or I tote my motherfucking gun and blast on the enemy. Nobody that wasn't heard of. You get me? Like 
it's like, then, a, like a like a secret code like nigga you don't talk about that shit and then if you you know it was so to hear an actual record and see physical record i could buy this motherfucker in the store and then put it in my tape deck and now i'm feeling good because even though i'm not from where he from or i'm not a i'm i'm i might be beefing with the blood niggas on here whatever it still feel good that now we got music that we felt like was representing us as as a as a who we were you get me and, and and because everything was negative you get me killings mm -hmm. and, and going to jail and prison and 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 crack selling and shit like that we looked at that as a positive thing oh these niggas made a record or shit right. that shit i might can make a record now you get me and that's where that came from <laughs> that influence that probably influenced a gang of motherfuckers at the time who we're going through that transgression of of I want to do something and get out of the shit I'm doing, but what do I do and keep that same respect from niggas like I'm still, you know, in the streets and and raps that was it because now I could still dress like I dress, I could still wear what I wear, I could still claim what I claim, but then. I'm doing something, you get me? I'm making records, positive shit, you know? So it, it was a blessing for all of us, you get me? And the reason, yeah, and I agree. And the reason that I asked that is because you and Quick were uh, really like the pioneers of that as well. Before Banging on Wax had come out, you were you were even saying it on tracks. We were, you guys were like the original Banging on Wax. At least the stems of the idea kind of came from what you guys were doing. Um, and it was just great to see. So, I mean, with all the music you've done, I had to get your input on what you thought of those records coming out. It's good to hear it. Um, and growing up, I was I've always been a hip hop head, always been huge fans of the underground and and things like that. And uh, there was a record that I heard um, growing up. And his name was Lil Chill. And then when I heard Lil Chill, I always thought to myself, I was like, this this guy kind of reminds me of MC8 a little bit. Like he, there was definitely an MC8 influence there. As we had talked, I later on, later on came to find out that that's the Chill's little brother. Um, Ain't No Love Lost was a, a, a CD that we used to bump all the time here in Canada. And um, I was just curious on what was your relationship like with Lil Chill? Um, it was it was good. I mean, like I said, he was. You know, my little brother, you know, uh, I got to, you know, they um, I have a brother who used to try to rap. He was on a couple of songs. I put him on. Uh, I, he was on Last Man Standing. I think the business he was on the West Side remix uh, that I had on the on the uh, maxi single. So they they were influenced by, you know, the big brothers, um, just like we were influenced by the big brothers, King T, Toddy T, so to speak, Mixmaster Spade. Um, he was around. And of course, naturally, you know, when you see your brothers, you know, getting into this field of, of rapping and, and hip hop and uh, they're starting to speak on tales and you starting to craft your stuff. And a lot of it is going to be about the tales that you see or what you see that your your brothers are, are experiencing. So a lot of that is going to rub off. And, and so that's what made him be able to go out and pursue his own, you know, uh, rap career and put out his first cd just just being influenced you know basically just being influenced by what he was surrounded with you know just like we were right that's good man and um one thing i noticed too about when you went to who banging and uh you start as we spoke earlier about the production with with dj slip and stuff like that how did you end up linking up with Binky? Was that was that someone that Mac Ten brought to you? Because I see that out of all the albums, DJ Slip kind of stepped back a little bit, and 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 Binky stepped in, and as well as Ant Banks, he had some production on there as well. But um, yeah, how did you end up linking up with Binky? How did that happen? Well, basically, um, from the time that um, I uh, left Sony, and then. Uh, Slip had a lot of production on the NOTR project, but after that didn't go through, you know, it was basically like done from there, you know, um, 
me and Slip, who had probably been uh, around each other for the last 10, 15 years, there was no more, you know, the studio door got locked, so to speak. So now it's time to go either producing for other people or try to find another profession. And that's what Slip did. Slip started doing robotics and, you know, he was working on offshore rigs and shit like that. And I tried to continue my career doing something else. So when I got with Who Banging, you know, I hadn't talked to Slip probably in two years. You oh, know, okay. yeah. yeah, I hadn't talked to Slip in probably two years. So, uh, yeah, from the time that I left Sony to actually securing the deal with Who Banging Priority, yeah, I probably hadn't talked to Slip in about a year and a half, maybe. Well, probably so, probably since Last Man Standing, right? Exactly. Because even though we worked on NOTR together, uh, he basically produced uh, the whole record of NOTR. I was just the executive on that project because I'm the one who had the production deal. And, you know, things kind of go left, you know you know feelings get involved and then on top of that when you when the money stops and like i said they lock the studio door it's time to go pursue other interests and so i went and got another record deal which they had a stable of producers already you get me binky was producing for west side connection he was producing for mac 10 they had their own project out all from the eye so Naturally, he was going to be the first choice who was brought in because Mac 10 is going, we got producers already. We're not going to go deal with niggas on the outside. You get me? We're going to deal with who's ever in house. So that's how, you know, it was Binky. It was young Trey. It was fucking uh, Aunt Banks, you know, who I had knew. Um, Aunt Banks was another real good, good friend of mine. So, I use what was available to me. You get me? Yep. And it, it, it's crazy though, because, um, I mean, you, you're, you're a real one, man. You're, you're a real dude. And, um, even with what you just said, even in section eight, with what you just said, new producers, you didn't forget about slip. Cause he came through with days of 89. Definitely. That, that it, it just shows the love keeps him in the loop. I mean, it, it's a, it's a real thing to do. So big ups on that. For sure. Yeah, Slip always had my best interest as far as production because, like I said, being with a motherfucker so long, he just he just knows my flavor. He he already knew when I heard that track, it was just going to be automatic because he knows my flavor. So, you know, just like tracks like fucking um, uh, um, uh, <sighs> What's that? Late Night Hype Part 2 on Death Threats. Or the Days of 89. Slip knows my flavor. He's one of those dudes that I could just say, hey, man, I need a beat. And I don't have to go, well, you know, can you do this? Or can you do it like this? Or can you? All I have to do is wait for him to send it back. And I already know it's going to be automatic. So being able to incorporate him, like I said, even though Mac Tien had his own stable of of produ producers, you know, I was still able to reach out and be like, hey, Slip, you know, I know I ain't fucked with you in a minute, but uh, I'm doing this record, Section 8, Priority, and I need a track. And bingo, he sent over Days of 89. Gave you that shit. Honestly, hey, man, it's been a pleasure having you come through the 90 Proof Lounge, man. Big fan. Thank you for blessing us with these conversations about your career and the amazing music that you've done and the acting that you've done. We'd love to have you on again, man. Thank you for coming through, man. We appreciate it. For sure, man. Anytime, man. Holla at me. You got my number. You got the hookup, man. So let's do it again. For sure. A absolutely, bro. Yeah.